book two chapter seven of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven return doctor's degree karlstadt luther's oath principle of reform luther's courage first views of reformation the schoolmen spalatin affair of reuchlin luther quitted rome and returned to wittemberg his heart full of sadness and indignation turning away his eyes in disgust from the pontifical city he directed them in hope to the holy scriptures and to that new light of which the word of god seemed then to give promise to the world this word gained in his heart all that the church lost in it he detached himself from the one and turned towards the other the whole reformation was in that movement it put god where the priest had hitherto been Staupitz and the elector did not lose sight of the monk whom they had called to the university of wittemberg it would seem that the vicar-general had a presentiment of the work that was to be done in the world and feeling it too much for himself wished to urge on luther there is nothing more remarkable and perhaps more mysterious than this personage who is ever found hurrying on the monk into the path to which god calls him and who himself ultimately goes and sadly ends his days in a convent the preaching of the young professor had made an impression on the prince he had admired the vigour of his intellect the nervousness of his eloquence and the excellence of his expositions the elector and his friend wishing to advance a man who gave such high hopes resolved to make him take the honourable degree of doctor of divinity staupitz repairing to the convent led luther into the garden and there alone with him under a tree which luther was afterwards fond of showing to his disciples the venerable father said to him it is now necessary my friend that you become a doctor of the holy scriptures luther recoiled at the idea the high honour frightened him look out replied he for a more worthy person as for me i cannot consent to it the vicar-general insisted the lord god has much to do in the church and has need at present of young and vigorous doctors these words adds melanchthon were perhaps used half in jest and yet the event realised them many omens ordinarily precede great revolutions it is not necessary to suppose that melanchthon here speaks of miraculous predictions the most incredulous age that which preceded our own saw this sentiment verified there was no miracle and yet how many presages announced the revolution with which it closed but i am weak and sickly replied luther and have not long to live seek a strong man the lord replied the vicar-general has work in heaven as well as on the earth dead or alive god has need of you in his counsel none but the holy spirit can make a doctor of theology exclaimed the monk still more alarmed do what your convent asks said staupitz and what i your vicar-general command you promised to obey us but my poverty replied the friar i have no means of paying the expenses attendant upon such promotion give yourself no trouble about them said his friend the prince has been graciously pleased to take all the expenses on himself luther thus urged saw it his duty to yield this was towards the end of the summer of fifteen hundred and twelve luther set out for leipzig to receive the money necessary for his promotion from the elector's treasures but according to the usages of courts the money came not the friar getting impatient would have left but monastic obedience detained him at length on the fourth of october he received fifty florins from pfeffinger and john Dolzig, and gave them his receipt for it in which he designates himself merely as a monk i martin says he friar of the order of eremites luther hastened back to wittemberg andrew bodenstein was then dean of the faculty of theology and is best known under the name of karlstadt 
being that of his native town. He was also called ABC. It was Melanchthon who first gave him this designation, which is taken from the three initial letters of his name. Bodenstein acquired the first elements of literature in his native place. He was of a grave and gloomy temper, perhaps inclined to jealousy, and of a restless intellect, eagerly bent, however, on acquiring knowledge, and endowed with great ability. He attended different universities in order to increase his acquirements, and studied theology even at Rome. On his return from Italy into Germany, he established himself at Wittenberg, and became doctor in divinity. At this period, says he himself afterwards, I had not read the Holy Scriptures. This account gives a very just idea of what the theology of that day was. Karlstadt, besides being a professor, was a canon and archdeacon. This is the person who was at a later period to make a rent in the Reformation. In Luther at that time he saw only an inferior, but the Augustine soon became an object of jealousy to him. I am not willing, said he one day, to be a smaller man than Luther. When Karlstadt conferred the highest university degree on his future rival, he was far from foreseeing the celebrity which the young professor was destined to obtain. On the 18th of October, 1512, Luther was admitted a licentiate in theology, and took the following oath. I swear to defend evangelical truth by every means in my power. The following day, Bodenstein, in the presence of a numerous assembly, formally delivered to him the insignia of Doctor of Theology. He was made Biblical Doctor, not Doctor of Sentences, and in this way was called to devote himself to the study of the Bible, and not to that of human tradition. The oath, then, which he took was, as he relates, to his well-beloved Holy Scripture. He promised to preach it faithfully, to teach it purely, to study it during his whole life, and to defend it by discussion and by writing, as far as God should enable him so to do. The solemn oath was Luther's call to be the reformer. In laying it upon his conscience freely to seek, and boldly to announce Christian truth, this oath raised the new doctor above the narrow limits to which his monastic vow might perhaps have confined him. Called by the university and by his sovereign, in the name of the emperor and of the see of Rome itself, and bound before God by the most solemn oath, he was thenceforth the intrepid herald of the word of life. On this memorable day, Luther was dubbed Knight of the Bible. Accordingly, this oath taken to the Holy Scriptures may be regarded as one of the causes of the renovation of the Church. The infallible authority of the Word of God alone was the first and fundamental principle of the Reformation. All the Reformations in detail which took place at a later period as reformations in doctrine, in manners, in the government of the church, and in worship, were only consequences of this primary principle. One is scarcely able at the present time to form an idea of the sensation produced by this elementary principle, which is so simple in itself, but which had been lost sight of for so many ages. Some individuals of more extensive views than the generality alone foresaw its immense results. The bold voices of all the reformers soon proclaimed this powerful principle, at the sound of which Rome is destined to crumble away. Christians receive no other doctrines than those which are founded on the express words of Jesus Christ, his apostles and prophets. No man, no assembly of doctors are entitled to prescribe new doctrines. The situation of Luther was changed. The call which the reformer had received became to him like one of these extraordinary calls which the Lord addressed to the prophets under the old dispensation, and to the apostles under the new. The solemn engagement which he undertook made so deep an impression on his mind that, in the sequel, the remembrance of this oath was sufficient to console him amid the greatest dangers and the sharpest conflicts. And when he saw all Europe agitated and shaken by the word which he had announced, 
when it seemed that the accusations of rome the reproaches of many pious men and the doubts and fears of his own easily agitated heart would make him hesitate fear and give way to despair he called to mind the oath which he had taken and remained firm tranquil and full of joy i have advanced in the name of the lord said he on a critical occasion and i have put myself into his hands his will be done who asked him to make me a doctor if he made me let him sustain me or if he repents of having made me let him depose me this tribulation terrifies me not i seek one thing only and it is to have the lord favourable to me in all that he calls me to do another time he said he who undertakes anything without a divine call seeks his own glory but i dr martin luther was compelled to become a doctor papism sought to stop me in the discharge of my duty and you see what has happened to it and still worse will happen they will not be able to defend themselves against me i desire in the name of the lord to tread upon the lions and trample underfoot the dragons and vipers this will commence during my life and be finished after my death from the hour when he took the oath luther sought the truth solely for itself and for the church still deeply impressed with recollections of rome he saw indistinctly before him a course which he determined to pursue with all the energy of his soul the spiritual life which had hitherto been manifested within him was now manifested outwardly this was the third period of his development his entrance into the convent had turned his thoughts towards god the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins and of the righteousness of faith had emancipated his soul and his doctor's oath gave him that baptism of fire by which he became the reformer of the church his thoughts were soon directed in a general way to the subject of reformation in a discourse which he had written apparently with a view to its being announced by the provost of litzkau at the council of lateran he affirmed that the corruption of the world was occasioned by the priests who instead of preaching the pure word of god taught so many fables and traditions according to him the word of life alone had power to accomplish the spiritual regeneration of man hence even at this period he made the salvation of the world depend on the re-establishment of sound doctrine and not on a mere reformation of manners luther was not perfectly consistent with himself he entertained contradictory opinions but a powerful intellect was displayed in all his writings he boldly broke the links by which the systems of the schools chained down human thought passed beyond the limits to which past ages had attained and formed new paths for himself god was in him the first opponents whom he attacked were those famous schoolmen whom he had so thoroughly studied and who then reigned as sovereigns in all universities he accused them of pelagianism and forcibly assailing aristotle the father of the school and thomas aquinas undertook to tumble both of them from the throne on which they sat the one ruling philosophy and the other theology aristotle porphyry the theologians of sentences the schoolmen wrote he to langer are the lost studies of our age there is nothing i more ardently long for than to expose this player who has sported with the church by wrapping himself up in a greek mask and to make his disgrace apparent to all in all public disputations he was heard to say the writings of the apostles and prophets are more certain and more sublime than all the sophisms and all the theology of the school such sayings were new but people gradually became accustomed to them about a year after he could triumphantly write god works our theology and saint augustine make wonderful progress and reign in our university aristotle is on the decline and is already tottering to his speedy and eternal overthrow the lessons on the sentences are admirable for producing a yawn no man can hope to have an audience if he does not profess biblical theology happy the university to which such a testimony can be given 
at the same time that luther attacked aristotle he took the part of erasmus and reuchlin against their enemies he entered into communication with these great men and others of the learned such as perkheimer mutian and hutton who belonged more or less to the same party at this period he formed another friendship also which was of great importance to him during his whole life there was then at the court of the elector a man distinguished for wisdom and candour named george spalatin born at spalatus or spalt in the bishopric of eichstadt he had at first been curate of the village of hohenkirch near the forest of thuringia and was afterwards selected by frederick the wise to be his secretary and chaplain and also tutor to his nephew john frederick who was one day to wear the electoral crown spalatin retained his simplicity in the midst of the court he appeared timid on the eve of great events circumspect and prudent like his master when contrasted with the impetuous luther with whom he was in daily correspondence like Staupitz, he was made for peaceful times such men are necessary somewhat resembling those delicate substances in which we wrap up gems and trinkets to protect them from injury in travelling they seem useless and yet without them the precious jewels would have been broken and destroyed spalatin was not fitted to do great things but he faithfully and unostentatiously acquitted himself of the task which had been assigned to him he was at first one of the principal assistants of his master in collecting those relics of saints of which frederick was long an amateur but gradually along with the prince turned toward the truth the faith which was then reappearing in the church did not take the firm hold of him that it did of luther he proceeded at a slower pace he became luther's friend at court the minister through whom all affairs between the reformer and the princes were transacted the mediator between the church and the state the elector honoured spalatin with his friendship when on a journey they always travelled in the same carriage in other respects the air of the court often half suffocated the good chaplain he took fits of melancholy and would have liked to quit all his honours and be again a simple pastor in the woods of thuringia but luther consoled him and exhorted him to remain firm at his post spalatin acquired general esteem the princes and the learned of his time testifying the sincerest regard for him erasmus said i inscribe the name of spalatin not only amongst those of my principal friends but also amongst those of my most venerated patrons and this is not on paper but on my heart the affair of reuchlin and the monks was then making a great noise in germany the most pious men were often at a loss as to the party which they ought to embrace for the monks wished to destroy jewish books which contained blasphemies against christ the doctor of wittemberg being now in high repute the elector ordered his chaplain to consult him on this subject the following is luther's reply it is the first letter which he addressed to the preacher of the court what shall i say these monks pretend to drive out beelzebub but not by the finger of god for this i cease not to lament and groan we christians begin to be wise abroad and we are void of sense at home on all the places of jerusalem are blasphemies a hundred times worse than those of the jews the world is filled with spiritual idols inspired with a holy zeal we should put away and destroy these internal enemies whereas we leave the matter which is most pressing the devil himself persuading us to abandon our own business at the same time that he prevents us from amending what belongs to others end of book two chapter seven book two chapter eight of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Popular Declamations, Moral Purity of Luther, Mysticism, Spenlein, Justification by Faith, Necessity of Works. 
luther did not lose himself in this quarrel living faith in christ filled his heart and his life in my heart said he faith in my lord jesus christ reigns soul and soul ought to reign he alone is the beginning the middle and the end of all the thoughts which occupy my mind night and day he was always heard with admiration when he spoke of this faith in christ whether in the professor's chair or in the church his lessons diffused light and men were astonished at not having sooner perceived truths which in his mouth appeared so evident the desire of justifying ourselves said he is the source of all anguish of heart whereas he who receives jesus christ as a saviour has peace and not only peace but purity of heart sanctification of the heart is entirely a fruit of faith for faith is in us a divine work which changes us and gives us a new birth emanating from god himself it kills adam in us by the holy spirit which it communicates to us giving us a new heart and making us new men it is not by hollow speculation exclaimed he again but by this practical method that we obtain a saving knowledge of jesus christ at this time luther preached discourses on the ten commandments which have come down to us under the name of popular declamations undoubtedly there are errors in them for luther himself was enlightened only by degrees the path of the just is like the shining light which shineth more and more unto the perfect day but in these discourses what truth what simplicity what eloquence how easy to conceive the effect which the new preacher must have produced upon his audience and his age we will only quote one passage taken from the commencement luther goes up into the pulpit of wittemberg and gives out these words thou shalt have no other god before me then addressing himself to the people who filled the church he says all the sons of adam are idolaters and guilty of violating this first commandment this strange assertion no doubt surprises his hearers he must therefore justify it and accordingly proceeds there are two kinds of idolatry the one without the other within the one without is when man worships wood and stone beasts and stars the one within is when man fearing punishment or seeking his ease does not give worship to the creature but loves it internally and confides in it what religion is this you do not bend the knee before riches and honours but you offer them your heart the noblest part of you ah you worship god with the body and with the spirit you worship the creature this idolatry reigns in every man until he is cured of it freely by the faith which is in jesus christ and how is this cure performed in this way faith in christ strips you of all confidence in your own wisdom your own righteousness your own strength it tells you that if christ had not died for you and so saved you neither yourself nor any creature could have done it then you learn to despise all those things which remained useless to you there now remains to you only jesus jesus alone jesus fully sufficient for your soul no longer having any hopes in the creatures you have now christ only in whom you hope all and whom you love above all now jesus is the soul the only the true god when you have him for god you have no longer other gods it is thus luther shows how by the gospel the soul is brought back to god its sovereign good agreeably to the words of jesus christ i am the way no man cometh unto the father but by me the man who speaks thus to his age is not merely desirous to overthrow some abuses he is first of all desirous to establish true religion his work is not merely negative it is primarily positive luther afterwards directs his discourse against the superstitions with which christendom then abounded against signs and mysterious characters 
observations of certain days and certain months familiar demons ghosts the influence of the stars and wizards metamorphoses incubuses and succubuses the patronage of saints etc etc he attacks these idols one after the other and vigorously casts down these false gods but it was at the university especially in the presence of enlightened youths eager for truth that luther laid open all the treasures of the word of god his mode of explaining the scriptures says his illustrious friend melancthon was such that in the judgment of all pious and enlightened men it was as if a new light had risen upon doctrine after a long dark night he pointed out the difference between the law and the gospel he refuted the error then prevalent in churches and schools that men merit the forgiveness of sins by their own works and are rendered righteous before god by means of external discipline he thus brought back the hearts of men to the son of god like john the baptist he pointed to the lamb of god who had taken away the sins of the world he explained how sins are pardoned freely for the sake of the son of god and how man receives the blessing through faith he made no change in ceremonies on the contrary the established discipline had not in his order a more faithful observer and defender but he laboured more and more to make all comprehend the great and essential doctrines of conversion of the forgiveness of sins of faith and the true consolation which is to be found in the cross the pious were charmed and penetrated with the sweetness of this doctrine while the learned received it gladly one would have said that christ the apostles and prophets were coming forth from darkness and a loathsome dungeon the firmness with which luther fortified himself by scripture gave great authority to his teaching while other circumstances added to his power his life corresponded to his words his discourses were not merely from the life they came from the heart and were exemplified in all his conduct and when the reformation burst forth many influential men who were much grieved at seeing the rents that were made in the church won over by the reformer's purity of conduct and his admirable talents not only did not oppose him but even embraced the doctrine to which his works bore testimony the more they loved christian virtue the more they inclined to the reformer all honest theologians were in his favour such is the testimony of those who knew him in particular of melancthon the wisest man of his age and erasmus luther's celebrated opponent yet prejudice has dared to speak of his debauchery wittemberg was changed by this preaching of faith and became the focus of a light which was soon to illumine germany and diffuse itself over all the church in fifteen hundred and sixteen luther published a treatise by an anonymous mystic theologian probably ebland priest at frankfurt entitled german theology wherein the author shows how man may attain perfection by the three methods of purification illumination and communion luther never plunged into mystical theology but he received a salutary impression from it it confirmed him in the disgust which he felt for dry scholastics in his contempt for the works and observances so much dwelt upon by the church in his conviction of man's spiritual impotence and of the necessity of grace and in his attachment to the bible to the schoolmen wrote he to staupitz i prefer the mystics and the bible thus placing the mystics by the side of the inspired writers perhaps the german theology also assisted him in forming a sounder idea of the sacraments and especially of the mass for the author of that work insists that the eucharist gives christ to man but does not offer christ to god luther accompanied this publication with a preface in which he declared that next to the bible and st augustine there was no book he had ever met with from which he had learned more respecting god christ man and all things already several doctors had begun to inveigh against the professors of wittemberg and to accuse them of innovation 
one would suppose continues luther that there never were men before us who taught as we do yea verily there were but the wrath of god which our sins have deserved did not permit us to see them and to hear them for a long time the universities kept the word of god lying in a corner let them read this book and then tell me if our theology is new for this book is not new but if luther took all the good that was in mystical theology he took not the bad that was in it the great error in mysticism is to overlook a free salvation we are going to see a remarkable example of the purity of luther's faith luther possessed of a tender and affectionate heart was desirous to see those whom he loved in possession of the light which had guided him into the paths of peace and availed himself of all the opportunities which he had as professor preacher and monk as well as of his extensive correspondence to communicate his treasure to others one of his old brethren of the convent of erfurt the monk george spenlein was then in the convent of memmingen after having spent some time at wissemberg spenlein had asked the doctor to sell different articles which he had left viz a tunic of brussels cloth a work of a doctor of isenach and a monk's frock luther carefully executed this commission i have received said he to spenlein in a letter seventh of april fifteen sixteen a florin for the tunic half a florin for the book and a florin for the frock and have remitted the whole to the father vicar to whom spenlein owed three florins but luther passes quickly from this account of monastic spoils to a more important subject i should like much says he to friar george to know how it is with your soul is it not weary of its own righteousness does it not breathe at length and confide in the righteousness of christ in our day pride seduces many especially those who do their utmost to become righteous not comprehending the righteousness which is freely given us of god in christ jesus they would stand before him by their merits but that cannot be when you lived with us you were in this error as i also was i am still constantly fighting with it and have not yet completely triumphed o oh, my dear brother learn to know christ and christ crucified learn to sing unto him a new song to despair of thyself and say thou o lord jesus thou art my righteousness and i am thy sin thou hast taken what is mine and given me what is thine what thou wert not thou hast become in order that what i was not i might become take care o oh my dear george not to pretend to such a purity as will make you unwilling to acknowledge yourself a sinner for christ dwells in sinners only he came down from heaven where he dwelt among the righteous that he might dwell also among sinners meditate carefully on this love of christ and thou wilt derive ineffable blessing from it if our labours and our afflictions could give us peace of conscience why should christ have died thou wilt find peace only in him by despairing of thyself and of thy works and learning with what love he opens his arms to thee takes upon him all thy sins and gives thee all his righteousness thus the powerful doctrine which had already saved the world in the days of the apostles and which was to save it a second time in the days of the reformers was expounded by luther with force and clearness stretching over numerous ages of ignorance and superstition he here shook hands with st paul spenlein was not the only person who he sought to instruct in this fundamental doctrine he felt uneasy at the little truth which he had discovered in this respect in the writings of erasmus it was of importance to enlighten a man whose authority was so great and whose genius was so admirable but how was he to do it his friend at court the elector's chaplain was respected by erasmus and it is to him luther addresses himself my dear spalatin the thing which displeases me in erasmus that man of vast erudition is that by the righteousness of works or of the law of which the apostle speaks he understands the fulfilment of the ceremonial law 
the justification of the law consists not in ceremonies only but in all the works of the decalogue when these works are performed without faith in christ they may it is true make fabriciouses reguluses and other men of strict integrity in the eyes of the world but then they as little deserve to be called righteousness as the fruit of a meddler to be called a fig for we do not become righteous as aristotle pretends by doing works of righteousness but when we have become righteous we do such works the man must first be changed and then the works abel was first pleasing to god and then his sacrifice luther continues i pray you fulfil the duty of a friend and of a christian by making erasmus acquainted with those things the letter is dated in haste from the corner of our convent nineteenth of october fifteen hundred and sixteen it gives a true view of the footing on which luther stood with erasmus and shows the sincere interest which he felt in whatever he thought truly advantageous to this distinguished writer no doubt at a later period the opposition of erasmus to the truth forced luther to combat him openly but it was only after he had sought to enlighten his opponent at length those views on the nature of goodness were propounded which were at once clear and profound and the great truth was distinctly proclaimed that the real goodness of a work consists not in its external form but in the spirit in which it is done thus giving a mortal blow to all the superstitious observances which had for ages choked the church and prevented christian virtues from growing and flourishing in it i read erasmus again writes luther but he is every day losing his credit with me i like to see him with so much skill and firmness rebuking priests and monks for their loathsome ignorance but i fear he will not do great service to the doctrine of jesus christ what is of man has more hold on his heart than what is of god we live in dangerous times a man is not a good and judicious christian because he understands greek and hebrew jerome who knew five languages is inferior to augustine who knew only one though erasmus thinks differently i am very careful to conceal my sentiments concerning erasmus lest i should give an advantage to his opponents it may be the lord will give him understanding in his own time the impotence of man and the omnipotence of god were the two truths which luther wished to re-establish it is a sad religion and a sad philosophy which throws man back upon his natural powers ages have made trial of these boasted powers and while man has of himself succeeded wonderfully in things which concern his earthly existence he has never been able to dissipate the darkness which hides the true knowledge of god from his mind nor to change a single inclination of his heart the highest degree of wisdom attained by ambitious intellects or minds inflamed with ardent longings after perfection has only plunged them into despair the doctrine therefore which unveils to us our impotence in order to acquaint us with a divine power which shall enable us to do all things is a generous consoling and perfectly true doctrine and the reformation which exhibits the glory of heaven on the earth and pleads the rights of almighty god with men is a great reformation but nobody was better aware than luther of the intimate and indissoluble tie which unites the gratuitous salvation of god with the free works of man nobody showed better than he that it is only by receiving all from christ that man can give much to his brethren he always presented the two acts that of god and that of man in the same picture thus after having explained to friar spenlein wherein saving righteousness consists he adds if you believe these things firmly as you ought to do for cursed is he who believeth not receive thy still ignorant and erring brethren as jesus christ has received thee bear with them patiently make their sins thy own and if thou hast any good thing communicate it unto them receive one another saith the apostle as christ hath received us to the glory of god 
it is a sad righteousness which will not bear with others because it finds them wicked and which thinks only of seeking the solitude of the desert instead of doing them good by patience prayer and example if thou art the lily and the rose of christ know that thy dwelling is among the thorns only take care that thou do not by thy impatience thy rash judgments and thy hidden pride become thyself a thorn christ reigns in the midst of his enemies had he been pleased to live only among the good and to die only for those who loved him for whom i ask would he have died and among whom would he have lived it is touching to see how luther himself carried these precepts of charity into practice an augustine of erfurt named george leifer was subjected to severe trials luther learned it and eight days after he had written the letter to spenlein went up to him kindly and said i learn that you are agitated by many tempests and that your spirit is tossed up and down upon the billows the cross of christ is portioned out over all the earth and each one receives his part do not you then reject that which is fallen to you rather receive it as a holy relic not in a vessel of gold and of silver but what is far better in a heart of gold a heart full of meekness if the wood of the cross has been so sanctified by the blood and flesh of christ that we consider it to be the most venerable relic how much more ought we to regard the injuries persecutions inflictions and hatred of men as holy relics since they have not only been touched by the flesh of christ but embraced kissed and blessed by his boundless love end of book two chapter eight book two chapter nine of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 First Theses, Visit to the Convents, Dresden, Erfurt, Tornator, Peace and the Cross, Labours, The Plague. The instructions of Luther bore fruit. Several of his disciples already felt themselves urged publicly to profess the truths which the lessons of their master had revealed to them. Among his hearers was a learned youth named Bernard of Feldkirchen, professor of the physics of Aristotle in the university, and who, five years afterwards, was the first of the evangelical ecclesiastics who entered into the bond of matrimony. Luther, while he was presiding, desired Feldkirchen to maintain theses in which his principles were expounded. The doctrines professed by Luther thus acquired new publicity. The disputation took place in 1516, and was Luther's first attack on the reign of the Sophists and the papacy. However feeble it was, it gave him considerable uneasiness i allow these propositions to be printed said he many years after on publishing them in his works principally in order that the greatness of my cause and the success with which god has crowned it may not puff me up for they fully manifest my shame that is to say the infirmity and ignorance the fear and trembling with which i commenced this struggle i was alone and had imprudently plunged into this affair not being able to draw back i conceded several important points to the pope and even adored him the following are some of these propositions the old man is vanity of vanities he is wholly vanity and renders all other creatures vain how good soever they be the old man is called the flesh not only because he is led by sensual lusts but also because even though he were chaste prudent and just he is not born anew of god by the spirit a man who is without the grace of god cannot observe the commands of god nor prepare himself in whole or in part to receive grace but necessarily remains under sin the will of man without grace is not free but enslaved and that voluntarily 
Jesus Christ, our strength and our righteousness, who trieth the hearts and reins, is alone the searcher and judge of our merits. Since everything is possible through Christ to him who believeth, it is superstitious to seek other aid, whether in the will of man or in the saints. This disputation made a great noise, and has been considered as the commencement of the Reformation. The moment approached when this Reformation was to burst forth. God was hastening to prepare the instrument which he meant to employ. The elector, having built a new church at Wittenberg, to which he gave the name of All Saints, sent Staupitz into the Netherlands to collect the relics with which he was desirous to enrich it. The vicar-general ordered Luther to take his place during his absence, and in particular to pay a visit to forty monasteries in Misnia and Thuringia. Luther repaired first to Grimma, and thence to Dresden, everywhere labouring to establish the truths which he had ascertained, and to enlighten the members of his own order. "'Don't attach yourself to Aristotle, or to other teachers of a deceitful philosophy,' said he to the monks, but diligently read the word of God. Seek not your salvation in your own strength and your own good works, but in the merits of Christ and in divine grace. An Augustine monk of Dresden had run off from his convent and was living at Mayence when the prior of the Augustines had received him. Luther wrote to the prior to demand restitution of the lost sheep, and added these words which are full of truth and charity. I know that offences must come. It is no wonder that man falls, but it is a wonder if he rises again and stands erect. Peter fell, in order that he might know that he was a man, and we still see the cedar of Lebanon fall. Angels, even, a thing which surpasses our comprehension, fell in heaven, and Adam fell in paradise. Why then be astonished when a reed is shaken by the wind and the smoking flax is quenched? From Dresden, Luther proceeded to Erfurt to do the duties of vicar-general in the very convent where, eleven years before, he had wound up the clock, opened the door, and swept the church. He appointed his friend, bachelor John Langer, a learned and pious but austere man, prior of the convent, exhorting him to affability and patience. Shortly after he wrote him, Show a spirit of meekness toward the prior of Nuremberg. This is fitting, inasmuch as the prior has put on a sour and bitter spirit. Bitter is not expelled by bitter, that is to say, devil by devil, but sweet expels bitter, that is to say, the finger of God casts out demons. It must perhaps be regretted that on different occasions Luther did not remember this excellent advice. At Neustadt on Orla there was nothing but division. Quarrelling and disturbance reigned in the convent. All the monks were at war with the prior and assailed Luther with their complaints. The prior, Michael Dressel, or Tornator, as Luther calls him, translating his name into Latin, on his part explained all his grievances to the doctor. Peace, peace, said he. You seek peace, replied Luther, but you seek the peace of the world and not that of Christ. Know you not that our God has placed his peace in the midst of war? He whom nobody troubles has no peace. But he, who, troubled by all men, and by all the things of life, bears all calmly and joyfully, possesses true peace. You say with Israel, Peace, peace, and there is no peace. Say rather with Christ, The cross, the cross, and there will be no cross. For the cross ceases to be a cross as soon as we can sincerely say with joy, O oh, blessed cross, there is no wood like thine. After his return to Wittenberg, Luther, wishing to put an end to these divisions, allowed the monks to elect another prior. Luther returned to Wittenberg after an absence of six weeks. He was grieved at all that he had seen, but the journey gave him a better acquaintance with the church and the world, gave him more confidence in his intercourse with men, 
and furnished him with numerous opportunities of founding schools and urging this fundamental truth that the holy scripture alone shows us the way to heaven and to exhort the brethren to live together holily chastely and peacefully doubtless much seed was sown in the different augustine convents during this journey of the reformer the monastic orders which had long been the stay of rome perhaps did more for the reformation than against it this is true especially of the order of augustine's almost all pious men of a free and exalted spirit who were in cloisters turned to the gospel and a new and noble blood soon circulated in their orders which were in a manner the arteries of german catholicity the world knew nothing of the new ideas of the augustine of wittemberg after they had become the great subject of conversation in chapters and monasteries in this way more than one cloister was a seminary of reformers at the moment when the great blow was struck pious and brave men came forth from their obscurity and abandoned the retreat of the monastic life for the active career of ministers of the word of god even during the inspection of fifteen hundred and sixteen luther by his words awoke many slumbering spirits and hence this year has been called the morning star of the gospel day luther resumed his ordinary avocations at this period he was oppressed with work it was not enough that he was professor preacher and confessor he had moreover a variety of temporal business connected with his order and his convent i almost constantly require two clerks wrote he for i do little else the whole day than write letters i am preacher to the convent chaplain at table pastor and parish minister director of studies vice prior which means prior eleven times over inspector of the ponds at litzkau advocate of the inns at herzberg at torgau reader of st paul commentator on the psalms i have seldom time to say my hours and chant to say nothing of my combat with flesh and blood the devil and the world see how lazy a man i am about this time the plague broke out in wittemberg and a great part of the students and teachers left the town luther remained i don't well know wrote he to his friend at erfurt if the plague will allow me to finish the epistle to the galatians prompt and brisk it makes great ravages especially among the young you advise me to flee whither shall i flee i hope the world will not go to wreck though friar martin fall if the plague makes progress i will disperse the friars in all directions but for myself i am stationed here and obedience permits me not to flee till he who has called me recall me not that i do not fear death for i am not the apostle paul i am only his commentator but i hope the lord will deliver me from fear such was the firmness of the doctor of wittemberg will he whom the plague could not force to recoil one step recoil before rome will he yield to the power of the scaffold end of chapter nine book two chapter ten of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten relations of luther with the elector counsels to the chaplain duke george his character luther before the court dinner at court emser's supper the same courage which luther displayed in presence of most formidable evils he displayed in the presence of the great the elector was much pleased with the vicar-general who had made a good collection of relics in the netherlands luther gives an account of it to spalatin there is something curious in this affair of relics occurring at the moment when the reformation is about to commence assuredly the reformers had little idea of the point at which they were to arrive 
a bishopric seemed to the elector only a fit recompense to the vicar-general luther to whom spalatin wrote on the subject strongly disapproved of it many things replied he please your prince which however displease god i deny not his ability in the affairs of the world but in what concerns god and the salvation of souls i account him sevenfold blind as well as his counsellor pfeffinger i say not this behind their backs like a slanderer don't hide it from them for i am ready to say it personally to both why continues he would you environ this man with all the whirlwinds and tempests of episcopal cares the elector did not take luther's frankness in bad part the prince says spalatin in a letter to him often speaks of you and with much respect frederick sent the monk stuff to make a cassock of very fine cloth it would be too fine said luther were it not the gift of a prince i am unworthy that any man should think of me far less that a prince should and so great a prince the most useful persons to me are those who think the most ill of me return thanks to our prince for his favour but i know that i desire not to be praised by you or by any man all praise of man being vain and the praise which cometh from god alone being true the excellent chaplain did not wish to confine himself to his court functions he desired to render himself useful to the people but like many of all times he wished to do it without giving offence he not only wished not to irritate any one but on the contrary to conciliate general favour point out says he to luther some work which i may translate into our mother tongue a work which will please generally and at the same time be useful agreeable and useful replies luther the request is beyond me the better things are the less they please what is more salutary than jesus christ and yet to most he is a savour of death you will tell me that you wish to be useful to those who love what is good in that case just let the voice of christ be heard you will be agreeable and useful depend upon it but it will be to a very small number for the sheep are rare in this region of wolves luther however recommended to his friend the sermons of tauler i have never seen said he either in latin or our own tongue a sounder theology or one more agreeable to the gospel taste and see how sweet the lord is but be it after you have tasted and seen how bitter everything is that is ours it was in the course of the year fifteen hundred and seventeen that luther entered into communication with duke george of saxony the house of saxony had then two heads the princes ernest and albert carried off in their youth from the castle at altenburg by kunz of kaufungen had by the treaty of leipzig become the founders of the two houses which still bear their name the elector frederick the son of ernest at the period of which we write was the chief of the ernestine branch while his brother duke george was the chief of the albertine branch dresden and leipzig were in the states of the duke who had his residence in the former of these cities his mother sidonia was daughter of george podiebrad king of bohemia the long struggle which bohemia had maintained with rome from the days of john huss had had some influence on the prince of saxony and he had often shown a desire for a reformation he has sucked it from his mother it was said he is by birth an enemy of the clergy he in various ways annoyed the bishops abbots canons and monks insomuch that his cousin the elector was more than once obliged to interpose on their behalf it might have been supposed that duke george would be a warm partisan of the reformation devout frederick on the contrary who had once put on the spurs of gregory in the holy sepulchre girt himself with the great ponderous sword of the conqueror of jerusalem and taking an oath to combat for the church like a bold knight might have been expected to prove one of the most eager champions of rome but when the gospel is in question the anticipations of human wisdom are often at fault 
the result was the opposite of what might have been supposed the duke would have taken pleasure in humbling the church and those connected with it and lowering the bishops whose princely train far surpassed his own but to receive into his heart the evangelical doctrine which must have humbled it to acknowledge himself a guilty sinner incapable of being saved unless through grace was quite a different matter he would willingly have reformed others but he had no desire to reform himself he would perhaps have assisted in obliging the bishop of mentz to be contented with a single bishopric and have no more than fourteen horses in his stable as he himself repeatedly expressed it but when he saw another than himself appear as reformer when he saw a mere monk undertake the work and the reformation gaining numerous adherents among the humbler classes the haughty grandson of the hussite king became the most violent adversary of the reform of which he had at first promised to be a partisan in july fifteen hundred and seventeen duke george asked Staupitz to send him a learned and eloquent preacher Staupitz sent luther representing him as a man of great learning and irreproachable character the prince invited him to preach at dresden in the chapel of the castle on the feast of st james the elder on the day fixed the duke and his court proceeded to the chapel to hear the preacher of wittemberg luther gladly seized the occasion to bear testimony to the truth before such an assembly he took for his text the gospel of the day then came to him the mother of zebedee's children with her sons matthew twenty verses twenty to twenty five he preached on the wishes and rash prayers of men then dwelt strongly on the assurance of salvation making it rest on this foundation that those who hear the word of god with faith are the true disciples whom jesus christ has elected unto eternal life he next treated of eternal election showing that this doctrine when exhibited in connection with the work of christ is well fitted to calm the terrors of conscience and so instead of disposing men to flee from god allures them to seek their refuge in him in conclusion he brought forward a parable of three virgins and drew a very instructive improvement from it the word of truth made a deep impression on the hearers two in particular appeared to give earnest attention to the discourse of the monk of wittemberg the one was a respectable-looking lady who sat in one of the court pews and whose features bespoke deep emotion it was madame de la salle grand mistress to the duchess the other was jerome emser a licentiate in canon law and secretary and counsellor to the duke emser was a man of talent and extensive information a courtier and able politician his wish would have been to please both parties at once to pass at rome for a defender of the papacy and at the same time figure in germany among the learned men of the age but under this flexible spirit a violent temper lay concealed thus luther and emser who were afterwards repeatedly to break a lance met for the first time in the chapel of the castle of dresden the dinner bell having rung for the inmates of the castle the ducal family and the persons attached to the court were soon seated at the table the conversation naturally turned on the preacher of the morning how did you like the sermon said the duke to madame de la salle could i again hear such another discourse replied she i could die in peace and i replied george angrily would have given a good sum not to have heard it such discourses are good only to make people sin with confidence the master having thus stated his opinion the courtiers proceeded without restraint to express their dissatisfaction every one was ready with his remark some alleged that in the parable of the three virgins luther had had three ladies of the court in his eye on this the talk was endless they rallied the three ladies who they affirmed that luther had intended he is an ignorant blockhead said one he is a proud monk said another each had his comment on the sermon 
making the preacher say whatever he pleased. The truth had fallen into the midst of a court ill prepared to receive it. Every one tore at it at pleasure. But while the word of God was to many an occasion of stumbling, to the grand mistress it was a stone, elect and precious. Falling sick about a month after, she confidently embraced the grace of the Saviour and died rejoicing. In regard to the duke, perhaps the testimony which he had heard given to the truth was not in vain. However much he opposed the Reformation during his life, it is known that in his last moments he declared that his only hope was in the merits of Jesus Christ. It naturally fell to Emser to do the honours to Luther in his master's name. He accordingly invited him to supper. Luther refused, but Emser insisted and constrained him to come. Luther only expected to meet a few friends, but he soon perceived that a trap had been laid for him. A master of arts from Leipzig and several Dominicans were with the prince's secretary. The master of arts, who had an overweening opinion of himself and a deep hatred of Luther, accosted him with a bland and friendly air, but he soon broke out and screamed at full pitch. The battle began. The discussion, says Luther, turned on the absurdities of Aristotle and St. Thomas. At last, Luther challenged the Master of Arts, with all the erudition of the Thomists, to define what it was to fulfil the commandments of God. The Master of Arts, though embarrassed, put on a good countenance. "'Pay me my fees,' says he, stretching out his hand, "'da pastum.' One would have said he was going to give a lesson in form, mistaking the guests for his pupils. At this foolish reply, adds the reformer, we all burst a laughing, and the party broke up. During the conversation, a Dominican had been listening at the door, and would fain have come in to spit in Luther's face. He refrained, however, though he afterwards made a boast of it. Emser, who had been delighted at seeing his guests battling, while he seemed to hold a due medium, hastened to apologize to Luther for the manner in which the party had gone off. Luther returned to Wittenberg. End of Book Two, Chapter Ten. Book Two, Chapter Eleven of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne. Translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Return to Wittenberg Theses Nature of Man Rationalism Demand at Erfurt Eck Urban Regius Luther's Modesty Luther zealously resumed his labours. He was preparing six or seven young theologians who were forthwith to undergo an examination in order to obtain a license to teach. And what most delighted him was that their promotion was to be to Aristotle's disgrace. I should like, said he, to multiply his enemies as fast as possible. With that view he at this time published theses which deserve attention. The leading topic which he discussed was liberty. He had already glanced at it in the theses of Feldkirchen, but now went deeper into it. Ever since Christianity began, there has been a struggle, more or less keen, between the opposite doctrines of the freedom and the slavery of man. Some schoolmen had taught, like Pelagius and others, that man possessed in himself the liberty or power of loving God and doing good. Luther denied this liberty, not to deprive man of it, but, on the contrary, to make him obtain it. The struggle, then, in this great question is not, as is usually said, between liberty and servitude, but between a liberty proceeding from man and a liberty proceeding from God. Some who call themselves the advocates of liberty say to man, You have the power of doing good and require a greater liberty. Others who have been called advocates of slavery say to him on the contrary, You have no true liberty, 
but god offers it you in the gospel the one party speaks of liberty but a liberty which must end in slavery while the other speaks of slavery in order to give liberty such was the struggle in the time of st paul in the time of augustine and in the time of luther those who say change nothing are champions of slavery those who say let your fetters fall are champions of liberty it would be a mistake however to suppose that the whole reformation can be summed up in this particular question it is one of the many doctrines which the wittemberg doctor maintained that is all it would above all be a strange illusion to hold that the reformation was fatalism or an opposition to liberty it was a magnificent emancipation of the human mind bursting the numerous bands with which thought had been bound by the hierarchy and reviving the ideas of liberty right and examination it delivered its own age and with it ours also and the remotest posterity and let it not be said that the reformation while it freed man from human despotism enslaved him by proclaiming the sovereignty of grace no doubt it wished to bring back the human will to the divine to subordinate the one and completely merge it in the other but what philosopher knows not that entire conformity to the will of god alone constitutes sovereign perfect freedom and that man will never be truly free until supreme righteousness and truth have sole dominion over him the following are some of the ninety-nine propositions which luther sent forth into the church in opposition to the pelagian rationalism of scholastic theology it is true that man who is become a corrupt tree can only will and do what is evil it is not true that the will when left to itself can do good as well as evil for it is not free but captive it is not in the power of the will of man to choose or reject whatever is presented to it man cannot naturally wish god to be god his wish is that he himself were god and that god were no god the excellent infallible and sole preparation for grace is the eternal election and predestination of god it is false to say that when man does all he can he clears away the obstacles to grace in one word nature possesses neither a pure reason nor a good will on the part of man there is nothing which precedes grace unless it be impotence and even rebellion there is no moral virtue without pride or sullenness that is to say without sin from the beginning to the end we are not the masters of our actions but the slaves of them we do not become righteous by doing what is righteous but having become righteous we do what is righteous he who says that a theologian who is not a logician is a heretic and an adventurer maintains an adventurous and heretical proposition there is no form of reasoning syllogism which accords with the things of god if the form of the syllogism could be applied to divine things we should know the article of the holy trinity and should not believe it in one word aristotle is to theology as darkness is to light man is more hostile to the grace of god than he is to the law itself he who is without the grace of god sins incessantly even though he neither kills nor steals nor commits adultery he sins for he does not fulfil the law spiritually not to kill and not to commit adultery externally and in regard to action merely is the righteousness of hypocrites the law of god and the will of man are two adversaries who without the grace of god can never agree what the law wishes the will never wishes only from fear of it may make a showing of wishing the law is the hangman of the will and is subject only to the child who has been born unto us isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 the law makes sin abound for it irritates and repulses the will 
but the grace of god makes righteousness abound through jesus christ who makes us love the law every work of the law appears good externally but internally is sin the will when it turns toward the law without the grace of god does so only for its own interest cursed are those who do the works of the law blessed are all those who do the works of the grace of god the law which is good and in which we have life is the law of the love of god shed abroad in our hearts by the holy spirit romans chapter 5 verse 5 grace is not given in order that works may be done more frequently and more easily but because without grace there cannot be any work of love to love god is to hate oneself and know nothing out of god in this way luther attributes to god all the good that man can do the thing to be done is not to repair or so to speak to patch up the will of man an entirely new will must be given him god alone could say this for god alone could perform it this is one of the greatest and most important truths that the will of man can acknowledge but luther while proclaiming the impotence of man did not fall into the opposite extreme he says in the eighth thesis it follows not that the will is naturally bad that is to say that its nature is of the essence of evil as the manichees taught originally the nature of man was essentially good but it turned aside from goodness that is god and is inclined to evil still its origin remains holy and glorious and is capable by the power of god of regaining its original the object of christianity is to restore it the gospel it is true exhibits man in a state of degradation and impotence but as placed between two glories and two grandeurs a past glory from which he has been precipitated and a future glory to which he is called this is the truth and man knows it to be the truth and how little soever he thinks of it he easily discovers that all which is told him of his actual purity power and glory is only a lie designed to cradle his pride and rock it asleep luther in his theses attacked not only the pretended goodness of man's will but also the pretended light of his understanding in regard to divine things in fact scholasticism has exalted reason as well as the will this theology in the hands of some of its teachers was at bottom only a species of rationalism the propositions which we have enumerated indicate this for they look as if directed against the rationalism of our own day in the theses which were the signal of the reformation luther attacked the church and the popular superstitions which to the gospel had added indulgences purgatory and numberless abuses in those which we have just given he attacked the school and the rationalism which had robbed the gospel of the doctrine of the sovereignty of god his revelation and his grace the reformation attacked rationalism before it attacked superstition it proclaimed the rights of god before lopping off the excrescences of man it was positive before it was negative this has not been sufficiently attended to and yet without attending to it it is impossible duly to appreciate the character of this religious revolution be this as it may the truths which luther thus expressed with so much energy were quite new to maintain these theses at wittemberg had been an easy matter there his influence was paramount and it would have been said that he had chosen a field of battle where he knew no combatant could appear in offering battle in another university he gave them a greater publicity and it was by publicity that the reformation was effected he turned his eyes towards erfurt where the theologians had shown themselves so exasperated against him he accordingly sent his theses to john langer prior of erfurt and wrote him as follows my anxiety for the decision which you will give as to these theses is great 
extreme, too great perhaps, and keeps me on the rack. I much suspect that your theologians will consider as paradoxical and cacodoxical, that is, false doctrine, what I must henceforth regard as most orthodox. Tell me how it is, and as soon as you possibly can. Have the goodness to make known to the faculty of theology and to all that I am ready to come and publicly maintain these propositions, either in the university or the monastery. It does not seem that Luther's challenge was accepted. The monks of Erfurt contented themselves with intimating that his theses had incurred their high displeasure. But he was desirous to send them to some other part of Germany, and with that view bethought him of a man who plays an important part in the history of the Reformation, and with whom the reader must be made acquainted. A distinguished professor named John Mayer was then teaching at the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria. He was a native of Eck, a village in Swabia, and was commonly called Dr. Eck. He was a friend of Luther, who respected his talents and acquirements. Full of intellect, he had read much, and was possessed of a very retentive memory. To erudition he added eloquence. His voice and gesture bespoke the vivacity of his genius. In regard to talent, Eck was in the south of Germany what Luther was in the north. They were the two most distinguished theologians of the period, though of very different views. Ingolstadt was almost the rival of Wittenberg. The reputation of these two doctors attracted crowds of eager students from all quarters to the universities in which they taught their personal qualities not less than their abilities, endearing them to their pupils. The character of Dr. Eck has been assailed, but an anecdote in his history will show us that at this period at least his heart was not closed against generous impressions. Among the students whom his fame had attracted to Ingolstadt was a young man named Urban Regius from the banks of an alpine lake. He had first studied at the University of Freiburg in Brisgau. On his arrival at Ingolstadt, to which he had been attracted by the fame of Dr. Eck, Urban engaged in his course of philosophy and gained the favour of his master. Requiring to provide for his maintenance, he was under the necessity of taking charge of some young noblemen, and had not only to superintend their studies and their conduct, but also to purchase on his own account whatever books and clothes they required. The youths dressed in style, and kept a good table. Regius, becoming embarrassed, prayed the parents to recall their sons. Never fear was the answer. His debts increased, his creditors became pressing, and he was at his wit's end. The emperor was raising an army against the Turks, and a recruiting party having arrived at Ingolstadt, Urban in despair enlisted. Clothed in military attire, he appeared in the ranks at the time when the review took place, previous to their departure. Dr. Eck, coming up at that instant with several of his colleagues, was greatly surprised to discover his students among the recruits. Urban Regius, said he, fixing his keen eye on him, here replied the recruit what i pray is the cause of this the young man told his story i take the matter upon myself replied eck and setting his halberd aside brought him off from the recruiting party the parents threatened by the doctor with the displeasure of the prince sent the necessary funds to defray the expenses of their children and Urban Regius was saved to become, at a later period, one of the pillars of the Reformation. Dr. Eck occurred to Luther as the proper person to publish his theses on Pelagianism and scholastic rationalism in the south of the empire. He did not, however, send them to the professor of Ingolstadt directly, but employed a mutual friend, the excellent Christopher Schurl, secretary to the town of Nuremberg, praying him to send them to Eck at Ingolstadt, which is at no great distance from Nuremberg. I send you, says he, my paradoxical and even cacistodoxical propositions, as many think them. 
communicate them to our dear friend the very learned and talented eck that i may learn and know what he thinks of them these were the terms in which luther then spoke of dr eck such was the friendship then subsisting between them it was not luther who broke it off ingolstadt however was not the field on which the battle was to be fought the doctrines on which these theses turned were perhaps of greater importance than those which two months after set the church in a blaze and yet notwithstanding of luther's challenges they passed unnoticed at most they were read within the circle of the school and produced no sensation beyond it the reason was because they were only university propositions and theological doctrines whereas the subsequent theses related to an evil which had grown up in the midst of the people and was then causing devastation in all parts of germany so long as luther was contented with reviving forgotten doctrines all was silence but when he attacked abuses which were universally felt every one turned to listen nevertheless all that luther proposed in either case was to produce one of those theological discussions which were then so common in universities to this circle his views were confined he was humble and his humility amounted even to distrust and anxiety considering my ignorance said he all i deserve is to be hid in a corner without being known by any one under the sun but a mighty hand drew him out of this corner in which he wished to remain unknown to the world a circumstance independent of luther's will threw him into the field of battle and the war commenced this providential circumstance we are now called upon to relate end of book two chapter eleven Book three of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christopher Smith. Book three The Indulgences and Theses, fifteen hundred and seventeen and fifteen hundred and eighteen. Chapter one Cortege, Tetzel tetzel's discourse sale of indulgences public penance letter of indulgence feasting and debauchery at this period the people of germany were all in motion the church had opened a vast market on the earth from the crowd of customers and the noise and pleasantry of the sellers one would have thought it a fair only a fair held by monks the merchandise which they were showing off and selling a bargain was as they said the salvation of souls the merchants travelled the country in a fine carriage accompanied by three mounted attendants journeying in grand style and living at great expense one would have said it was some high mightiness with his suite and officers and not a vulgar dealer or mendicant monk when the cortege approached a town a messenger was dispatched to the magistrate to say the grace of god and of st peter is at your gates immediately the whole place was in motion clergy priests nuns the council schoolmasters and their scholars the incorporations with their colours men and women old and young went out to meet the merchant with lighted tapers in their hand amid the sound of music and the ringing of bells insomuch says a historian that god himself could not have been received with greater honour after the formalities were over the whole body proceeded to the church the bull of grace by the pontiff was carried in front on a velvet cushion or cloth of gold next came the chief of the indulgence merchants carrying a large wooden cross painted red the whole procession moved forward amid hymns prayers and the smoke of incense the merchant monk and his attendants were received at the church by the pealing organ and thrilling music the cross was placed in front of the altar and over it the pope's arms were suspended 
all the time it remained there the clergy of the place the penitentiaries and sub-commissaries came each day after vespers or before the salute to do obeisance to it with white wands in their hands this grand affair produced a lively sensation in the quiet cities of germany at these sales one personage in particular drew the attention of the spectators it was he who carried the great red cross and played the principal character he was clothed in the dress of a dominican and had an arrogant air his voice was stentorian and though in his sixty-third year he seemed still in full vigour this man the son of one diez a jeweller of leipzig was called john diesel or tezel he had studied in his native town became bachelor in 1487 and two years after entered the dominican order numerous honours had accumulated on his head bachelor in theology prior of the dominicans apostolic commissary inquisitor hereticae previtatis inquisitor he had discharged the office of commissary of indulgences without intermission from fifteen hundred and two the skill which he had acquired as subaltern soon raised him to the office of commissary in chief he had eighty florins a month and all his expenses paid together with a carriage and three horses but his perquisites it is easy to comprehend what they were far exceeded his salary in fifteen hundred and seven at freiburg he gained two thousand florins in two days if he discharged the functions he had also the manners of a quack convicted of adultery and shameful misconduct at innsbruck his vices had almost cost him his life the emperor maximilian had ordered him to be put into a sack and thrown into the river but the elector frederick happening to arrive obtained his pardon the lesson which he thus received had not given him more modesty for he had two of his children along with him miltitz the pope's legate mentions the fact in one of his letters it would have been difficult to find in all the cloisters of germany a man better fitted for the traffic with which he was entrusted to the theology of a monk to the zeal and temper of an inquisitor he united the greatest effrontery but the thing which above all made the task easy to him was his skill in inventing extraordinary stories to captivate the minds of the people to him all means were good that filled his coffers raising his voice and giving free vent to his vulgar eloquence he offered his indulgences to every comer and knew better than any dealer at a fair how to set off his merchandise after the cross was erected and the arms of the pope suspended over it tetzel mounted the pulpit and with a tone of assurance began to extol the value of the indulgences in the presence of the crowd who had been attracted to the church by the ceremony the people listened and stared on hearing the wondrous virtues of which he told them a jesuit historian speaking of the dominicans with whom tetzel was associated says some of these preachers failed not as usual to outrage the subject which they treated and so to exaggerate the value of the indulgences as to make people suppose they were certain of their own salvation and of the deliverance of souls from purgatory as soon as the money was paid if such were the scholars we may judge what the master was let us listen to one of his harangues after setting up the cross indulgences are the most precious and most sublime gift of god this cross pointing to the red cross has the very same efficacy as the actual cross of jesus christ come and i will give you letters under seal by which even the sins which you may have a desire to commit in future will all be forgiven i would not exchange my privileges for that of st peter in heaven for i have saved more souls by my indulgences than the apostle by his sermons there is no sin too great for an indulgence to remit and even should any one the thing no doubt is impossible have done violence to the holy virgin mary mother of god let him pay let him only pay well and it will be forgiven him think then that for each mortal sin you must after confession and contrition do penance for seven years either in this life or in purgatory 
now how many mortal sins are committed in one day in one week how many in a month in a year a whole life ah these sins are almost innumerable and innumerable sufferings must be endured for them in purgatory and now by means of these letters of indulgence you can at once for life in all cases except four which are reserved for the apostolic see and afterwards at the hour of death obtain a full remission of all your pains and all your sins tetzel even made financial calculations on the subject do you not know said he that when a man proposes to go to rome or to any other country where travellers are exposed to danger he sends money to the bank and for every five hundred florins that he means to have gives five or six at most in order that by means of letters from the bank he may receive the money safely at rome or elsewhere and you for the fourth of a florin will not receive these letters of indulgence by means of which you might introduce into the land of paradise not worthless money but a divine and immortal soul without exposing it to the smallest risk tetzel next passed to another subject but more than this said he indulgences not only save the living they also save the dead for this repentance is not even necessary priest noble merchant wife young girls young men hear your departed parents and your other friends crying to you from the bottom of the abyss we are enduring horrible torments a little alms would deliver us you can give it and yet will not these words uttered by the formidable voice of the charlatan monk made his hearers shudder at the very instant continued tetzel when the piece of money chinks on the bottom of the strong box the soul comes out of purgatory and set free flies upward into heaven o oh, imbecile and brutish people who perceive not the grace which is so richly offered to you now heaven is everywhere open do you refuse at this hour to enter when then will you enter now you can ransom so many souls hard-hearted and thoughtless man with twelve pence you can deliver your father out of purgatory and you are ungrateful enough not to save him i will be justified on the day of judgment but you you will be punished so much the more severely for having neglected so great salvation i declare to you that though you had only a single coat you would be bound to take it off and sell it in order to obtain this grace the lord our god is no longer god he has committed all power to the pope then trying to avail himself of other weapons still he added know you why our most holy lord is distributing so great a grace his object is to raise up the ruined church of st peter and st paul so that it may not have its equal in the universe that church contains the bodies of the holy apostles peter and paul and of a multitude of martyrs owing to the actual state of the building these holy bodies are now alas beaten flooded soiled dishonoured and reduced to rottenness by the rain and the hail ah are these sacred ashes to remain longer in mud and disgrace this picture failed not to make an impression on many who felt a burning desire to go to the help of poor leo the tenth who had not wherewith to shelter the bodies of st peter and st paul from the rain then the orator opened on the arguers and traitors who opposed his work i declare them excommunicated exclaimed he afterwards addressing docile souls and making a profane use of scripture happy are the eyes which see what you see for i tell you that many prophets and many kings have desired to see the things which you see and have not seen them and to hear the things which you hear and have not heard them and at last showing the strong box in which the money was received he usually concluded his pathetic discourse with this triple appeal to the people bring 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 these words says luther he uttered with such horrible bellowing that one might have thought it was a mad bull making a rush at people and striking them with his horns 
when his discourse was ended he came down from the pulpit ran towards the chest and in presence of the people chucked a piece of money into it taking care to make it give a very loud tinkle such were the discourses which astonished germany heard in the days when god was preparing luther at the termination of the discourse the indulgence was understood to have established its throne in the place in due form confessionals were set up adorned with the pope's arms the sub-commissaries and the confessors whom they selected were considered to represent the apostolic penitentiaries of rome at the jubilee and on each of these confessionals were posted in large characters their names surnames and designations then a crowd pressed forward to the confessor each coming with a piece of money in his hand men women and children the poor even those who lived on arms all found means of procuring money the penitentiaries after having anew explained the greatness of the indulgence to each individual asked how much money can you afford to part with in order to obtain so complete a forgiveness this question says the instruction of the archbishop of mentz to the commissaries this question ought to be put at this moment that the penitents may thereby be the better disposed to contribute four valuable graces were promised to those who aided in building the basilisk of st peter the first grace which we announce to you said the commissaries according to their letter of instruction is the complete pardon of all sins after this came three other graces first the right of choosing a confessor who whenever the hour of death should seem to be at hand would give absolution from all sins and even from the greatest crimes reserved for the apostolic see second a participation in all the blessings works and merits of the catholic church in prayers fastings alms and pilgrimages and third the redemption of the souls which are in purgatory to obtain the first of these graces it was necessary to have contrition of heart and confession of the lips or at least the intention of confessing but for the three others they could be obtained without contrition or confession merely by paying previous to this christopher columbus extolling the value of gold had said quite gravely he who possesses it may introduce souls into paradise such was the doctrine taught by the archbishop cardinal of mentz and the commissaries of the pope as to those said they who would deliver souls from purgatory and procure for them pardon of all their offences let them throw money into the chest it is not necessary for them to have contrition of the heart or confession of the lips let them only hasten with their money for they will thus do a work most useful to the souls of the departed and to the erection of the church of st peter greater blessings could not be offered at a cheaper rate when the confession was over and it did not take long the faithful hastened towards the cellar one only had charge of the sale and kept his counter near the cross he carefully eyed those who approached him examining their air bearing and dress and asked a sum proportioned to the appearance which each presented kings queens princes archbishops bishops were according to the regulation to pay twenty-five ducats for an ordinary indulgence abbots counts and barons paid ten others of the nobility rectors and all who had an income of five hundred florins paid six those who had two hundred florins a year paid one others only a half moreover when the tax could not be followed to the letter full powers were given to the commissary apostolic who was to arrange everything in accordance with the dictates of sound reason and the generosity of the donor for particular sins tetzel had a particular tax polygamy paid six ducats theft in a church and perjury nine ducats murder eight ducats magic two ducats samson who carried on the same traffic in switzerland as tetzel in germany had a somewhat different tax for infanticide he charged four livres tournois for parricide or fratricide a ducat 
the apostolic commissaries sometimes encountered difficulties in carrying on their trade it often happened both in towns and villages that husbands were opposed to the whole concern and prohibited their wives from giving anything to these merchants what then were devout spouses to do have you not your dowry or some other property at your own disposal asked the dealers in that case we may dispose of part for so sacred a purpose even against the will of your husbands the hand which had given the indulgence could not receive the money this was prohibited under the severest penalties for there might be good reason to suspect that that hand would not have been faithful the penitent himself behoved to deposit the price of his pardon in the chest angry looks were given to those who were audacious enough not to open their purses if among those who pressed forward to the confessionals there happened to be any one whose crime was publicly known though of a kind which the civil law could not reach he behoved first of all to do public penance for this purpose they first led him to a chapel or sacristy where they stripped him of his clothes and took off his shoes leaving him nothing but his shirt his arms were crossed upon his breast a light placed in one hand and a rod in the other then the penitent walked at the head of the procession which proceeded to the red cross he remained on his knees till the chant and the collect was finished then the commissary gave out the psalm miserere mei the confessors immediately approached the penitent and led him across the church towards the commissary who taking the rod from his hand and gently striking him thrice on the back with it said to him the lord hath pity on thee and forgive thy sin he then gave out the kyrie eleison the penitent was led back to the front of the cross and the confessor gave him the apostolic absolution and declared him restored to the company of the faithful sad mummery concluded with a holy expression which at such a moment was mere profanation it is worth while to know the contents of one of those diplomas of absolution which led to the reformation of the church the following is a specimen may our lord jesus christ have pity on thee n n and absolve thee by the merit of his most holy passion and i in virtue of the apostolic power entrusted to me absolve thee from all ecclesiastical censures judgments and penalties which thou mayest have deserved moreover from all the excesses sins and crimes which thou mayest have committed how great and enormous soever they may have been and for whatever cause even should they have been reserved to our most holy father the pope and to the apostolic see i efface all the marks of disability and all the notes of infamy which thou mayest have incurred on this occasion i remit the pains which thou shouldest have to endure in purgatory i render thee anew a partaker in the sacraments of the church i again incorporate thee into the communion of saints and re-establish thee in the innocence and purity in which thou wert at the hour of thy baptism so that at the moment of thy death the gate of entrance to the place of pains and torments will be shut to thee and on the contrary the gate which leads to the heavenly paradise will be opened to thee if thou art not to die soon this grace will remain unimpaired till thy last hour arrive in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen friar john tetzel commissary has signed it with his own hand how dexterously presumptuous and lying words are here intermingled with holy christian expressions all the faithful were required to come and confess at the place where the red cross was erected the only exceptions were the sick the aged and pregnant women if however there happened to be in the neighbourhood some noble in his castle or some great personage in his palace there was an exemption for him for he might not care to mingle with the crowd and his money was worth the going for 
if there happened to be a convent whose heads were opposed to the traffic of tetzel and prohibited their monks from visiting the places where the indulgence had erected its throne means were still found to remedy the evil by sending them confessors who were commissioned to absolve them against the will of their order and the will of their heads there was not a vein in the mine however small which they did not find means of working at length they arrived at the object and end of the whole affair the summing up of the cash for greater security the strong box had three keys one in the hands of tetzel the second in those of the treasurer appointed by the firm of fugger of augsburg who had been appointed agents in this vast enterprise while the third was entrusted to the civil authority when the moment arrived the counters were opened in the presence of a notary public and the whole was duly counted and recorded must not christ arise and drive these profane sellers from the temple the mission being closed the dealers relaxed from their labours it is true the instructions of the commissary-general forbade them to frequent taverns and suspicious places but they cared little for this prohibition sin must have appeared a very trivial matter to people who had such an easy trade in it the mendicants says a roman catholic historian led a bad life expending in taverns gaming-houses and places of infamy where the people retrenched from their necessities 